Hi there, I'm Patrick Stevens. I'm a software engineer at Couchbase um, and I started back in February with um, a mandate to try and improve the observability of Couchbase. Prior to that, I was working in primarily a defense domain for almost two decades. So getting logs and, and monitoring there is, is quite important and uh, can be quite difficult sometimes. Um, I'm gonna cover some of the issues we came across. I've got quite a longer blog post that covers them in much more detail with nice worked examples, which I'll pop the links up to. I'm just going to kind of give you a little bit of a flavor of what what we've been doing uh, and maybe some some simple examples to to lead you in. So go to go through a quick summary of what we what problems we had, you know, what, what kind of stuff we had to solve, what we did, and then a little overview of like some some tips and tricks I've got. So how could bad could it be? Um, what is it we need it to do? Um, I'm not going to go over it in a huge amount of detail, um, but essentially the, the main two things we need to cover are we don't want to change any of our logs. Um, there's loads of stuff already out there. We can't change it. We've got loads of support stuff we can't change. We have to be pragmatic. We don't have the resources to refactor all our log statements to standardize them and, and make it all you know, wonderful. And we've got all this existing tooling. We don't have the resources to do that when we're doing other things as well, functionality things. Uh, we did want to integrate into standard pipelines. Customers want their logs to go into their tools. Um, so we, we adopted an approach of using CNCF um, tooling. The idea being, you know, uh, if, if we take the industry standard approaches, uh, there will be a way to integrate them. And also, you know, a bit of future proofing as we move forwards, probably stuff's going to change. But if we're using the standard stuff, there's, there's, um, there's always a path from the current incumbent to the next, uh, rather than having your own bespoke solution, which you don't have to completely bodge into a completely different thing. Um, just on the Couchbase side, so the container that runs is, is a single container, but it's multi-process that writes logs into different files in different formats. Um, none of these logs get output by default to standard output. And there's additional tooling that goes in and extracts the logs. And this also has to run on-premise and in Kubernetes, which is one of the other reasons as well. We went with FluentBit starting from a, a nice embedded background. Um, you know, some other stuff as well. Uh, resource and security constraints, vital to have in some customers' uh, domains, you know, financial or um, healthcare. Um, and we also need to support different endpoints. So something that can send to S3, to um, cloud analytics, to Datadog, whatever you want, uh, without, without us having to write that code. Um, so if we can target something that, that then lets us say, oh, to a customer, if you want to use it to send it to a bespoke endpoint, then this is how you do it. And you can configure it as, as, um, as just a configuration option. So I'm going to cover what our, our logs look like. It all comes from the open source repo, which is linked there. I use these examples from, for continuous integration. So this is the repo, just showing just a quick quick overview of it. There's a, there's a test, test directory with all the log stuff in. And you can see there's kind of expected input, uh, known input and expected output there. So this is our audit log uh, or an example of some of the messages. It's just a simple JSON format. So one of the first ones we did because it worked well. And here's the kind of, this is the expected output. So during continuous integration, I can run this and I can just diff against it. And it, it makes a very simple, quick check. Uh, we've got... Uh, some more logs. This is a Java one, but as you can see, it, someone decided four characters was enough for the, the um, log level. Uh, we've got some standard Java stack traces, not too bad. And then you've got a humongous Java thread dump. So this is one log statement, and that's what they want. You know, this must be one log statement. Um, as you can see, it's, it's quite long, how useful it is. Not entirely certain, but, but we can have a look. Um, this is one of the problematic ones. This is uh, eventing. So it's got uh, multiple formats in the same file. You can kind of see there, there's different timestamps, um, the log levels, different cases. One of the lines doesn't have a log level. Um, and there's some you know, multi-line stuff as well. So those three lines there cover some of the problems we have to solve in a single kind of uh, log um, multi-format kind of approach. Um, and in fact, the timestamps in the end are just ignored and just use the time of parsing. Um, here's a similar log. Again, timestamps, different format, log levels, all, all in uppercase in this one, but that one doesn't have a level. 
Um, and you can see it's kind of an example. There's some bigger, bigger multi-line here as well, but it's very similar to the previous log. And actually those two are parsed together uh, while using the same, the same regex. They actually go to different streams. Uh, here's one of our large Erlang um, code base logs. So uh, this is where you generally get a lot of multi-line, but they, one good thing here is there's a nice uh, good regex for the, for the start of each line. But as you can see, the multi-lines, I mean, this is quite a small example, uh, but they can cover quite a few lines and um, have embedded data and stuff like that. So I, I had some problems with some of these Erlang ones, um, mostly to do with the regex side of things. Um, I think uh, on, on the next one I show, um, which is another um, um, Erlang one, but with more, more multi-line in it. This one had a problem um, the the first line parser couldn't handle the new you know uh, the close of of the um the closing bracket and then a new line as the part of the uh, first line parser so i had to tweak it slightly um so there, there were little problems like that which um which i came across during during the during the um work i was doing the other thing we have is rebalance reports um, these are big Big JSON, you can see there, you know, 447 kilobytes, but it's all one line. Um, and one big problem with it was uh, there's no new line at the end of it. Um, and the tail plugin doesn't flush until it hits a new line. Um, so I had to do some extra work to pre-process uh, some of these logs. Um, so basically add a new line to it um, so we could pre-process it. Um, but yeah, which is a bit frustrating, but that's just where we are. We, you know, we couldn't change those logs. They're actually in a read-only mount point as well. So what did we do? Um, kind of, I just want to give you a little summary of what we did and how we kind of got through it. Um, I'm hoping it will sort of cover a few things. Um, so uh, one, of my, one of my first things to do um, was add testing. You know, we, we were doing quite a few different logs. I wanted to test them and make sure that as we iterated it, we, 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 was, we weren't breaking any previous stuff. Um, and one of my key points here is, if you can, avoid writing brittle regexes. Uh, it's much easier to standardize your logging on the logging log producing side than it is to write some horrible regex that will probably break next time someone changes the logging. Um, I link out to my blog post there, but if you make sure your regex doesn't have the log, the default log key, which is what the tail plugin uses, um, by default, if it can't parse things, you can easily tell if your regex is failing to parse. Fluentbit doesn't really show you if the regex fails to parse without starting to look at metrics and stuff like that. But if you, so for my regexes, I never have the log key in it. So if I see that in the output, I know the regex has failed. Um, and yeah, so I started with the audit log. You saw that, that was a simple JSON one, so no regexes, so good, good first starting point. It was also what some of the security customers wanted. They wanted to forward it, all their audit logs and stuff to, to different endpoints for their security accreditors. It kind of put the whole framework in place and then I could iterate it. Um, I added a load of regression testing. As you add more logs, you find more problems. So there's corner cases in all those logs. They're not real logs, they're kind of examples of the worst bits of each log. Um, so we can iterate it. Um, and also as we upgrade Fluent Bit, we wanna make sure we're still parsing stuff because there were a few issues with parsing discovered from regression testing. Um, user regex testers, there's a lot of them. Uh, Calyptra have just added one, which is really good, but I, it wasn't available when I was doing this. Uh, Rubula is the one that's recommended, but again, they, they, they work well to validate your regex, but then transferring that and translating that into the Fluent Bit configuration, sometimes there's extra escaping and sometimes stuff just doesn't work. Um, and also take examples of those logs and do them locally, do everything locally. Don't run it in a massive Kubernetes stack. Um, so we added a watcher process as well. We had a requirement for dynamic configuration reloading, which is something Fluent Bit doesn't currently do. So when you change the configuration or something changes, uh, credentials, certificates, or whatever, we want to reload it. So I, I reuse the KubeSphere approach, which is now the Fluent Operator approach, which just has a simple watcher process in there that when the configuration changes, it restarts Fluent Bit. And that was just really quite simple, straightforward, and brought other benefits as well later on, where we can start adding in extra metadata as variables. Um, and I could do that rebalance report processing I touched on before. 
Um, and yeah, one other key aspect we need to make sure for our deployment is we never restart the pods unless we absolutely have to, because obviously the databases don't really like that. So if we're saying, oh, you've changed the log configuration just to do some minor you know, update, you want to send it somewhere else, change credentials. Now you need to wait for your database to restart. That's not going to go down very well. So again, it's all about localizing those changes and making sure it, it all works. And this KubeSphere approach was, was pretty, pretty straightforward. You know, I, I took, took their code, I extended it, added Couchbase specifics, and uh, yeah, it's, it's working pretty well. Uh, we've got it deployed now for, for about six months. So it's, uh, yeah, it's all going pretty well. Um, right, and then a general overview. Um, so what else did we do? So all the logs kind of, they're wildly inconsistent but they follow a, a similar pattern. Every log has a timestamp. Every log pretty much has a, a log level, you know, info, warning, whatever. Some didn't like the audit level, but I decided they were at a specific level for all of the statements. And then message is just everything that's not the not those, those other bits. So keep it simple, generic, so we can parse everything with it. Um, we then tag by file name, so we can route the different, yeah, we can do processing by file name, we can do routing to different endpoints by file name, which is which was quite key for, particularly for the audit log, you know, a lot of the time people, oh, I just want to see the logs, but actually audit logs have to go to maybe a security monitoring tool or something like that. Um, added common processing as well. So you saw the levels were wildly disparate there. You know, you've got info written in different cases and stuff like that. Uh, two, you know, four character debug rather than debug. So I added processing to standardize that to constrained enums, which then makes it work really well. Things like Grafana and stuff, you can filter on one value rather than all the variants of it. Same with file name. Um, I'm just showing you here, you know, the file name is really long. It includes the whole path. And that's a bit of a pain when, you, when you're using it in Grafana. Um, so I added extra, extra stuff to, to chop it up into smaller bits so we could then filter on that. Um, and added some extra metadata. So our pods include some configuration information. Oh, this, this pod is configured like this. Here's some variables. And it's nice to inject those into the logging so you can, you know, you can do more analysis on it when you, when you see the stuff come through. And things like version, you know, what version am I running? You know, all this, all this kind of stuff. So this is just showing you the file name chopped from that massive path, which is hard to see in Grafana, to individual file names there. The original stuff's all there. You've also got the levels you can kind of see there. They've all been constrained to a single set of values, which is good. Now, some tips kind of what we did that went well, what didn't work well, and, and maybe some bodges as well that, that we had in there. So what went well, community support was a great one for me. I've got it at the end, but a lot of the stuff I've shown you and how I did stuff came from examples from other people. Um, Fluent Bit just worked. We only had one issue I found during uh, regression testing while upgrading with, with that very humongous JSON stuff. It, it was failing on the really humongous ones after a parse, but that was fixed very quickly because I had a nice regression test straight away. I've contributed all these parsers back as well. Um, the stuff we took from KubeSphere, which is in the Fluent Operator now, great way to handle dynamic configuration reload and, and a lot of other stuff as well. The standardization stuff for the log levels, someone on Slack pointed me at it and I was like, oh, wow, it's quite a long set of filters, but they're very simple and they just sort of apply sequentially. Um, and another one, um, Couchbase does sort of redaction in uh, of its logging for like um, basically it hashes some of the strings that are, um, could be sensitive. So I, I demonstrated how you could do this with whilst you know in flight using Loire filters. And Loire filters seem to be like basically if you can't do anything any any other way, you can probably do it with Loire. Um, but you know it might be better to to do it a simpler way to start with. Um, yeah, so it was, it was, you know, everything just worked. It, it went pretty well, it was pretty straightforward. It was quite a good experience. And actually one of our customers uh, requested this kind of capability whilst I was developing it and they were already using Fluent Bit. So, you know, it, it just fed in seamlessly while we were doing it. Uh, and I definitely say contribute and sort of engage with the community. I've, I've had a really good time and people have really helped me out and, and stuff like that. Uh, things like the levels, but also um, uh, one came up recently I've not not added yet, but making numeric versions of the levels makes it much easier to do alerting and, and querying in, in some of the uh, some of the Grafana or, or Prometheus or whatever other stacks you're doing. 
what what went wrong or what to do when stuff goes wrong i do touch on it on my blog post down the bottom there but regexes are a nightmare you know you've got one problem you had a regex to solve it now you've got like 100 problems so try not to do them um, there's lots of tools to try and help you out but none of them are perfect um, the calypso tool is probably the closest because that kind of runs the same regex engine under under the hood i think it runs fluent d as a uh, as a container to, to do it um, simplify stuff people keep i see in the community channels people try and oh here's my, my output from kibana and it's not working it's like no no let's start at, you know start right at the beginning test locally start with known input to stand it out, see what it's doing there before you start adding in the whole downstream stack, which is can be pretty difficult to manage. Um, is, is there a problem with that? Is it not being sent there? You know, it might be unrelated to Fluent Bit. So yeah, just confirm what you think is true first at you know the earliest point you can. Add more logging, output to standard output. Don't use like, oh, I'm sending somewhere else and then I'll look at it there. Well, just look at the log straight out of Fluent Bit. It will tell you things like, uh, maybe you've got the wrong path in your, you know, your your environment variable, or or something like that. Your wildcard doesn't work. You haven't got permissions. These are all fun things to to discover that you won't find until you look at those logs. Um, and to be honest, I don't think I had any real problems with Fluent Bit. It was mostly what I was doing, or just my misunderstanding of of configuration, which I guess you know I've, I've tried to improve the documentation a little bit as well. But it, it's those kind of things. Um, generally speaking. It, it's probably working. It's the same as like never suspect a compiler bug when it's probably your code that's wrong. It's it's yeah, it, it's well, it works well usually. There's very specific problems sometimes um, with with specific releases, but generally I've I've not had a problem. Stuff's been working, and then you know it's just me that had it wrong. Uh, bodges, so rebalance reports. This is a massive bodge. Hopefully, be fixed in Couchbase Server at some point in the future, but we still have to support the existing ones. Essentially, it's a huge amount of complexity to manage adding a new line to the file. Um, we mount the logs volume uh, read only to make sure we can't change anything and, and you know protect it from that side. So I have to create a temporary copy, add a new line, manage that, make sure I don't fill the temporary copies up and clean them up when, when I finish with them. It's just a huge amount of complexity. Multi-format logs I touched on briefly before. Yeah, they've got... Uh, wildly different timestamps and timestamps don't parse properly with regex. So you can have a regex to extract the timestamp, but then it has to conform to the uh, the percentage wide. You only have one format for that. Um, so in the end, what I do, because I don't really care too much about the difference between when it was logged and when I parse it, I just ignore the timestamps and use the time of parsing by default. Um, so there is a bit of a difference and it affects my CICD because I have to ignore the value of the timestamp when I do a diff rather than the other logs because they always pass the right time that the log was created. You can just do a straightforward diff. Um, and I wanted to add those optional variables, but the, if you use the wrong filter, it just exits if they're not set. So it, I, you know, I, I had a bit of a, I switched from modify to the rec record modifier um, filter because it meant that I could just have, if any of these variables are here, put them in the output. Uh, and just give me, you know, just ignore the warning saying, oh, you haven't set this. It, it works really well. You know, those variables were set as environment variables by my watcher as part of the downward API. Um, so only reason once at startup just keeps injecting them in. It's, uh, it, it works pretty well um, and uh, helps me out quite a bit, actually, with some debugging and stuff like that, if you want to see more stuff. So my time's up, or more specifically, let's move on to the kind of the future work, what we're doing in the future. Uh, or now, um, but yeah. Um, so one thing I wanted to touch on, yeah, FluentCon uh, EU I went to, and there was loads of suggestions from that and like stuff, feedback that was really good. Uh, I didn't think, Loire, I was a bit concerned about performance of it, but loads of people were using it, so I've adopted it more heavily. On-premise deployments we're rolling out now, basically using my uh, container and configuration and deploying it on-premise. Um, I want to do monitoring CICD, so only I make a change, I've got known input, see what the impact of that changes on processing, performance, and stuff like that, um, which is a bit tricky, but Calypso have also introduced this whole custom plugin approach where you can feed it back, and, and it looks quite useful for that, so I can do CICD. Um, and there's new multi-line, multi-format options now in 1.8, but I'm still using the 1.7 stuff. 
Uh, but there's loads of good ideas and customer requests we've got on the backlog that we're, that we're slowly working our way through. And this is just the first part of our overall observability stuff. Um, so I'm hoping to get like tracing and, and metrics in, in there as well. Um, some more details, just, just some of the stuff. You know, we've got the repo. It's completely open source, Apache 2 license, so help yourselves. Um, documentation from Couchbase Operator goes into a lot more detail. Um, and that blog post on tips and tricks, I think, is would be quite useful. It's based on this pr presentation, but expanded for, you know, a, a lot more um, detail. And you can kind of work through it and see the specifics rather than me just talking through it. So thanks. Um, I think uh, we'll probably be moving into Q&A now, although I'll have, I'm presenting virtually, but I'll, I'll be joining shortly. Um, just some contact details as well. Feel free to ping me. I'm on the, the um, Fluent Slack channel as well. So yeah, that's uh, that's where we are, and I'll move to QA now. <laughs>